Good morning, Brushy Fork. We truly are in uncharted territory. Two weeks ago, we would have never imagined that we would be uh, doing church online, watching these videos without being able to meet together. But uh, the circumstances have changed, haven't they? Uh, the coronavirus outbreak has uh, sent us into social uh, distancing and we want to be good neighbors, uh, and we want to uh, protect those that are the most vulnerable. So here's where we find ourselves. Uh, I've recorded a sermon, and it was uh, weird preaching to an empty sanctuary, but I pray that the Lord will use it to edify your soul this week. And uh, we will continue doing this until we get the green light from our governing authorities uh, that it is safe to join back together. Let me just remind us that this is uh, not how God intended it. Uh, we may like the fact that we don't have to get dressed up. We can stay in our PJs. We can sit on our couch, lay out, and watch the sermon. But God intended us to be together. Uh, he created us as social beings, and he desires for us to come together and to worship him. So this is just going to be temporary. Uh, until our governing authorities tell us that we can get back together, and oh, we look forward to that day. I know on my end, this is a lot of work, uh, but I hope that it's edifying to you. Uh, we do need to pray for our brothers and sisters who are suffering. We need to pray for those that are in our community who may be suffering. I know of one pastor who is hospitalized right now, and, and one pastor that very well may be suffering uh, with the coronavirus. Uh, I know one pastor's wife uh, is not doing well. So we need to pray for our brothers and sisters and for our community too. This isn't over and we don't know where it's going to go, but we serve one who does. God knows. So let's pray and ask him to intercede. Ask him to stop the spread of this virus that he would heal those that need to be healed and, and that he would allow us to to minister in his stead at this time. This is the best that we can do right now. Uh, praying for our neighbor, uh, doing what we can, and worshiping at a distance. Uh, but we look forward to the time in which we can join together. I want you to think of maybe two or three songs, that uh, Christian songs that you can uh, listen to before the sermon. You can pause the video right now and listen to those. Uh, but uh, I hope that the, this message will be an encouragement to you. It's encouraged my heart. Uh, so uh, I'm, I've been praying for you and uh, look forward to the time in which we can meet together. Let's uh, be diligent to call one another, to stay connected, uh, to reach out, make sure that everybody's doing okay, uh, but to love on each other too. Uh, I enjoy and, and love every moment of being your pastor. So thank you for this opportunity, and uh, we'll get through this. The Lord will see us through. God bless and stay safe. If you would, turn with me to Psalm chapter 20, which is our call to worship this morning. Let's read the word of the Lord together. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointing. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of our Lord, our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. O Lord, save the king. May he answer us when we call. Aren't you glad that our Lord is the one whom we can call upon in times of trouble? Surely some do trust in chariots and in horses. But this morning our trust is in the name of the Lord. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you for this morning that you have given us. And Lord, we ask that uh, in these uh, uncertain times, Lord, in these times of trouble, Lord, we ask that you would meet with us. Even though that we are not meeting, or we are not meeting here together, Lord, we are spread uh, throughout our, our region. Lord, I just pray that you would be with us. Lord, uh, I pray that your spirit would meet with us where we are this morning. And Lord, we pray that you would be with our country. Lord, that you would uh, heal our land. Lord, this microorganism, this virus that has attacked our land, Lord, we ask that your mercy and your healing would be upon uh, our land. And Lord, that you would uh, deliver us from this trouble. Lord, that you would deliver us from this virus. So Lord, we, uh, we ask this in, in Jesus' name. And Lord, as we, uh, as we look to our service, I pray that even as we are at home and, and watching and listening to this, I pray, Lord, that it would, your spirit would move within us. Lord, these are uh, different times. But Lord, help us this morning. I pray that the, your word would be a comfort to us. Lord, that, that Psalm chapter 20 would remind us to, to put our focus on you. And Lord, as we look at, at Luke chapter 8. Lord, I pray that your spirit would call us to a faith that is vibrant in you. I pray, Lord, that if there is anyone that uh, hears this or watches this and, and they don't know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray, Lord, that uh, they would be called today to the salvation. Lord, that they would know you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that you would be with them. Lord, help us this morning. May your spirit teach us and guide us into the truth that you have for us. Lord, I pray that because of this message, Lord, not in my power, but in your spirit, Lord, he would make us more like Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, the title of my message is Jesus, Our Hope and Comfort. Many of you have heard this story before, but uh, I'll tell it again. Uh, there was a time in my life where uh, I faced a medical uncertainty. I was in uh, Guatemala. I was there uh, for uh, spring break, and I was getting ready to go home. And at the very end of that trip, just uh, approximately 40 minutes before we left for the airport, I came down with a uh, stomach problem. Uh, you would have found me in the bathroom uh, in all kinds of agony and all kinds of distress. Uh, I don't know if it was something that I ate or if it was a, a bug that I picked up from something, but uh, needless to say, I was in trouble. I was struggling. The only time in my life where I moved from praying to the Lord, Lord, uh, be with me, take this away, heal me, Lord, help me in this time. And after several hours of this, uh, Lord, if this is it, if this is the time, Lord, please take me quick. Lord, this is horrible. Can remember in that time of uncertainty, in that time of distress, that uh, I really truly knew what it was like to be alone. I, I truly knew what, what it was like because uh, partway through my distress, my team left. They left for the airport. Uh, they had to get home. And, and I was left with some newly minted friends. I was left with uh, uh, some people I had met over the week that I had been ministering there in Guatemala with the missionary and some of the, uh, those that were uh, in the church around there. But I can remember feeling very alone, wondering if this was it, if this bug was going to take my life. And I just prayed to the Lord, the Lord would, uh, would be honored and glorified in my life. Whatever I had done, I just wanted him to be glorified. There are times in our lives when we face when we face sickness and disease. In fact, we face uh, the very com confrontation of the death of the curse. And in those times, we feel lonely. 
In those times we feel afraid. In those times we feel uncertain. But here in Luke chapter 8, Jesus is going to remind us that in, in those uncertain times, there is a place where we can turn. There is a hope that we can have. So I encourage you to turn to, to Luke chapter 8. And we're going to read this together, starting in verse 40. Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him. For they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately his, her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowd surrounded you and are pressed in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing it, this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe. And she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James. And the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, child, arise. And her, and her spirit returned, and she got up at once, and he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Let's pray. Father, as we dive into this passage, I pray that your spirit would comfort us. Lord, in this time of, of uncertainty, Lord, in this time of trial for our nation and for our world, Lord, as we uh, do battle in a very real way against a virus, a, a microorganism, uh, something that we cannot see that is uh, wreaking havoc in the lives of many in our nation and around the world. Lord, I pray that this message of hope and comfort would be lifted up. And Lord, that those that hear it Lord, would, would look to you and that they would place their faith in you. And Lord, that we ask you for our healing. Lord, we run to you in faith, knowing that you are the one that can heal this. Lord, knowing that you are the one that gives hope, even amongst this uncertainty. So Lord, we lean on you. And Father, we ask you to go before us, to guide us, to comfort us, and to protect us. Lord, we thank you for this. May your spirit use this passage of scripture and use these words to touch our lives. And Lord, make us more like Jesus. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In times of medical trouble, seek Jesus because he is the only one who can heal for all eternity. That's the main idea that is wrapped up in, in Luke chapter 8. In times of medical trouble, Jesus encounters two women here in this passage, and they were facing medical trouble. And he wants to instruct his disciples and the crowd around him that he is the only one that can heal for all eternity. So let's look at this passage in depth. If we're going to see that in times of medical trouble, we're to seek Jesus, 
Because he's the one that can heal for eternity. First, we have to look to Jesus when life is uncertain. Look at verses 40 uh, through the beginning of 43. Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house. For he had only for, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him. It's interesting that we need to note at the, the very beginning of this that Luke wants us to, to recognize the, the nature of this crowd. And, and the reason that uh, he does that, the reason that he wants us to, to recognize the nature of the crowd is because the crowd oftentimes had very different reactions to Jesus. Some days the crowd was his friend, and some days the crowd had turned their back on him. But, but Luke wants us to know that this crowd today is for Jesus. They are welcoming him. Jesus is returning to them, and they have waited for him. So Luke wants us to know about the crowd and, and their disposition, but the main focus of this story is Jerry. And there came a man named Jairus who was a ruler of the synagogue. And, and this is significant. This is important. Jairus is a man who is a part of the religious establishment. He is a religious elite. He is part of the tribe of those who rule the nation of Israel. And here, Jairus is in trouble. You see, Jairus comes, and we should notice that uh, we are very close to Luke chapter 9, verse 51. It is in uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 51, that, that Jesus' focus changes. Jesus is, has been uh, going around the nation, and, and he has been addressing the religious leaders. He's been calling them to faith. He's been addressing the crowds and calling them to faith. But in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, Jesus changes his focus. His focus, he recognizes that the religious elite have set their faces against God. They have a, a stiff neck. And they will not hear the message of Jesus. So in Luke 9, 51, Jesus sets his sights on Jerusalem. Jesus sets his sights for the purpose for which God had given him to come, and that is to save his people from their sins. In just a few short period of time, we're going to see that Jesus changes his focus. But here in Luke chapter 8, just before that, a man of the religious leaders, he comes to Jesus. He is a, a ruler of the synagogue, and he falls at Jesus' feet. And he implores Jesus to come to his house. Why? Because Jesus is the only hope for his 12-year-old daughter. Jesus is the only one who can help him. You see, Jairus, whose cultural tribe, his, his religious tribe, has set their face against Jesus. But Jairus realizes that Jesus is the one he needs. And he comes and he implores Jesus. He falls down on his, on his face. He falls at Jesus' feet and implores him to come to his house. Because his little girl is sick. And she is dying. You see, Jairus, his faith is highlighted here because it is, it is a challenge for Jairus. Jairus has to go against his friends. He has to go against his peer group. Jairus has to go and seek Jesus. And Jairus does. It highlights Jairus' faith. He knows that Jesus is the only answer, and he seeks Jesus. So 
times of medical trouble, look to Jesus when life is uncertain. Jairus looks and sought out Jesus. I don't know if you've ever been there, but when I was lying on that floor in the bathroom in Guatemala and my team was leaving, and I was facing being alone, really alone. The uncertainty of that circumstance was uh, draining on my spirit to go along with the, the medical turmoil that I was in, in facing. I didn't know if I was going to die of dehydration. I didn't know if uh, my guts were going to come up through. Uh, I, I just did not know, and I was hurting. But in that bathroom, there was only one place that I could turn. And that was to Jesus. I could turn to Jesus because he holds every microorganism in his hand. Jesus is the one that, that holds us together. His providence is the one who keeps us breathing minute by minute by minute. And, and when there is no place else to turn, we can turn to Jesus. And that is what Jerry is real. And that's what we need to realize this morning, but the story doesn't just end there. We also have to see that we need to take a leap of faith, and if we do, we will be rewarded. Not only do we need to look to Jesus in times of uncertainty, but we need to take a leap of faith, because in that leap of faith, we can find his reward. Look at this. Starting in verse 43. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. And immediately her discharge of blood ceased. You see, in the middle of this heart-wrenching story of this 12-year-old that is facing death, in the, in the middle of the story of, of this religious leader who has to go against his, uh, his peers and seek out Jesus' help, we see that there is another woman in need. In fact, no one else around her knew that she was in need. At least that day. I'm sure her friends knew about her condition, but... This day, she was probably just a normal lady walking through the crowd. And as the crowds were pressing in on Jesus, and as he was making his way to Jairus' house, something happened. You see, this lady made it close enough to Jesus that she could reach out and she could touch the hem of his garment. And in fact, Probably the crowd didn't realize it, but they were too pressed in on Jesus, and, and, and uh, everybody else didn't realize it, but there was two people in this crowd that recognized that something had happened. The woman that reached out and touched Jesus, she knew something had happened, because immediately, as she reached out and touched his garment, she was healed. Jesus knew something had happened because he felt through the, the Holy Spirit the power of healing that left him and went to this lady, and she was healed. We need to back up and look at this because it is significant. This woman is in trouble. This woman that is healed by Jesus healed by the Spirit of God and by her faith, she is in trouble because she's had a, a discharge of blood for 12 years and, and look at the state of that. Notice what that would have meant. She would have been ceremonially unclean. She would have been separated from a religious practice that grounded the very culture that she lived in. She would have been probably separated in a very real way from her culture, from her family, from those around her. Anybody that would come in contact her with her would have to go through ceremonial cleansing. And, and this is greatly troubling. And you can imagine if, if you became a pariah of society, how troubling that would be. 
It's troubling enough for us to, to have social isolation in this time of uh, the coronavirus. But, but this lady had has experienced 12 years of social isolation. And not only that, she had spent all of her treasure, all of her money and all of her physical possessions, she had spent on physicians. She had spent all her living on physicians. She could not be healed by anyone. You see, this lady had no one else to turn to. She had exhausted every option, and the only option left was Jesus. She had sought every conceivable remedy and even had no more money. She had spent it all on medical treatment. And the diagnosis through these 12 years and the countless, countless, countless attempts to get healing from this disease, from this bleeding disorder, she could not be healed. Luke doesn't tell us about her motivation, but Mark also tells us about this story. And in, in Mark chapter 5, we, we understand why she went and just touched Jesus' garments. In Mark 25, in, verse 20, or in Mark 5, verse 28, this is her thinking behind what she's going to do. For she said, if I touch even his garments, then I will be made well. What an act of faith. This unnamed woman in the story of Luke. And let me just remind us that oftentimes uh, the gospel writers don't give us a name so that we can, can see ourselves in the story. When there is an unnamed person in the story of God, it's, it's not directed just to a certain specific circumstance. But oftentimes we can read ourselves into this and see that we could be that person. Jesus could do that for us. And her faith led her to come up behind him and touch the fringe of his garment. And immediately her discharge of blood ceased. Her faith is astounding, but this miracle is also astounding. Because it happened and nobody even noticed except for her and Jesus. But Jesus had a greater purpose. <laughs> Jesus recognized that someone had touched him and that the power of healing had, had gone from him and, and healed her. The Holy Spirit had, had uh, healed her even though she had just touched his garment. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me in verse 45? And then we see that all denied it. And then Peter opened his mouth. Master, the crowds surrounded you and are pressing in on you. Notice Jesus recognized something important had happened. And he didn't want to let this teaching moment pass. So Jesus asked. He asked the crowd, he asked his disciples, who touched me? And Peter, often the mouthpiece of the disciples and uh, the guy who we often think of as the person who opens his mouth and then inserts foot. Peter is the one who opens his mouth and in fact Luke is pretty nice to Peter. Luke records Peter's words, Master, the crowd surrounds you and are pressing in on you. Master, how are we to know who touched you? Don't you recognize the circumstances? Mark also gives us some insight into this. Mark records uh, Peter's words as saying, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? Jesus, don't you recognize the circumstance we're in? 
Jesus, can't you see that there is no way that we can know who touched you or what has happened? But this is what Jesus wants them to understand. Jesus wants them to understand that a lady's remarkable faith has done something and they don't even recognize it. And Jesus goes on to explain in verse 46. Someone touched me for I perceived that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. You see, Jesus reached out to the crowd and he says, someone touched me and I perceived that the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit has gone out from me. And at that moment, this woman knew that she could not just blend into the environment. She knew that Jesus knew. She stepped forward with trembling. She stepped forward fearful, not knowing what this was going to lead to. And she fell down at Jesus' feet. Notice that she is the second person. This day, that would fall at Jesus' feet. One asking for him to come to heal his daughter, and now this woman, <laughs> in fear and trembling, because she, her faith has already been answered, and she has already been healed, but Jesus has asked who has touched her, and she falls down and declares to all the people why she had touched him. She knew that if she touched him, she would be healed. And it was true. Because she said how she had been immediately healed upon that touch. See? We need to take a leap of faith towards Jesus in times of trouble because in that leap of faith we will be rewarded and look at this woman's reward in verse 48 and he said to her daughter your faith has made you well go in peace see Jesus doesn't kick her when she's down Instead, Jesus wanted to highlight the correct ends of faith. Jesus wanted to lift up what had happened while nobody noticed. Jesus wanted to lift up the power of God to save. And he looked at this woman and he said, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Jesus lifted up this this woman and her example, when there is no place to turn and you turn to Jesus and you take a leap of faith, he will catch you, he will save you, and he will give you life. But the story doesn't end there. You see, we return back to the story of Jairus and his daughter. And, and here we need to not only see that we are to look to Jesus when life is uncertain and to take the leap of faith when, and then we will be rewarded. But we are to thirdly see that we are to put our faith in Jesus when all hope is lost. Think of what has just happened. Jesus is on the way to, to Jairus' house to, to meet with his daughter who is lying in her bed dying. And Jesus encounters this other sick woman and she touches his garment and he, and he takes a moment and he asks, who was it that touched him? And, and he lifts her up as an example of faith. And she is healed because she believed that if she would touch Jesus, she would be healed. And Jesus sent her away with faith and in peace. But something happened. Verse 49, while he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house, from Jairus' house, came and said, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, do not fear, only believe and she will be well. 
And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. Think the crowd has just witnessed this amazing miracle and then this plummet of bad news comes the girl is dead in fact the person that comes from Jairus's house says don't even trouble the teacher anymore don't trouble him because she's already dead who can help her you see nobody thought there was any hope left she's dead but Jesus takes that moment of uncertainty and that moment of despair, the moment of ultimate loss of hope, the death of this loved one, this precious daughter, 12 years of age. Jesus says, do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. You see, Jesus had just lifted up this example of this woman of great faith who would touch his garment and she would be healed. And Jesus says, would you have faith like this woman? Would you believe that Jesus is the one who can heal? Would you believe that Jesus is your salvation? And then he came to the house. And he took into the house Peter and John and James, his three closest disciples, and the father and the mother. And they were all weeping for her. And then Jesus says something very curious. Do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. Everybody in that room recognized that this girl was not sleeping. They knew that she had passed from this life to the next. She was dead. So why does Jesus say, do not weep for she is not dead but sleeping? Jesus wanted them to recognize that in their midst was one who has power over death. Jesus is the one who was sent by God to fulfill the promise given in Genesis 3, 15. The curse that was laid on man, the curse that is plaguing us today, the curse that is there. Jesus is the one, the seed of, of, of Eve, that is to crush the head of the serpent. Jesus is the one who is the answer to this world's problems. Jesus is the one who who is the answer to death. Notice the reaction in verse 53. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. They didn't have faith to see Jesus' answer. They didn't have the faith to see who Jesus was was that's okay because Jesus goes on and does what he's going to do anyway but taking her by the hand he called saying child arise and something happened and her spirit returned and she got up at once and he directed that something should be given to her to eat. And her parents were amazed. You see, they didn't have faith to see who was in the room with him. The God of this universe who breathed the life into Adam and Eve. He's the one who can overcome the curse. And he's standing in the room. And they didn't have faith to see. But that's okay because Jesus was going to show them who he was. He is the Savior of the world. Jesus showed up and revealed to them who he was. What a powerful story. What a powerful example. 
see these two stories of Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 55 share with us, they show us that there are two options when we get saved. Option one, we receive healing that is ultimately from the Lord. And option two is we die from our sickness. And that may seem like a, block, uh, a bleak prognosis. Yes, there may be some of us that get the coronavirus and, and uh, the Lord will heal us ultimately. And he may use uh, the medical personnel and he may use medical technology and he may use the, the immune system that he designed us with. But ultimately it is God and his providence that heals us. But there may be some of us or our loved ones or our acquaintances who die from the sickness. This story has something to tell us, even with option two. Jesus is the Lord over death. We can know Jesus and his power either way. Both options are options that can have hope. Option one has hope because Jesus heals in this life. But option two can also have hope because Jesus is the one who can raise us from the dead. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and we will see Peter address this very issue. Peter or Paul tells us the power of God to resurrect. In fact, in, in a couple weeks and in a month, we're going to celebrate Easter, which is the celebration of the resurrection. Christmas and Easter are probably the two most important days on the calendar of the church. And re the Christmas is the beginning of Jesus' work, and Easter is the end of that work, and, and Jesus is raised from the dead. But, but Paul brings that home in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the imperish or do, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. We are without hope. Verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will, raise, will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must not must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the perishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written: Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, there is hope even when the circumstances are the bleakest. There is hope even in death. But to know that hope, to experience that hope, we have to know the best news. Before we can get to the best news, we have to Go over the bad news. The bad news is that we are sinners. The Bible is clear about this. Paul tells us in Romans that for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, we are sinners. That is the bad news. The bad news is that sin separates us from God. And that sin keeps us from a relationship with him. And that sin, in our sin, we are lost. And we are destined to eternity of suffering. But that's the bad news. Unfortunately, that's not the worst news. The worst news is that there's nothing that we can do about a circumstance. We are separated from God. Paul also tells us that the wages of sin is death. Uh, there is nothing that we do. We have earned death. And we have earned God's judgment. 
The worst news is that we can't change our circumstances. But thanks be to God, that is not where the story ends. Because in comes Jesus and the good news. The good news is that God has stepped in and he has done something. God has sent his son to be our savior. Jesus can do something when we can't. You see, Jesus lived the perfect life that we couldn't live. He obeyed the law. He was perfect in every way. He was righteous before God. And as a righteous substitute, he gave himself as the payment for many. He gave himself as the payment for you and I if we would believe in him. The best news is that we can have hope in Jesus. But the best news is that hope can be applied to our account. The Bible also says that if we believe in our heart and confess our sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we believe in our heart and ask him to forgive us, then we can be saved. The best news is that the hope of Jesus and his salvation can be applied to your account. It can be applied to you. So in these times of uncertainty, we don't know what's going to happen with the coronavirus. We don't know whose lives are going to be affected. But there is hope no matter what happens, and that hope is Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are in a state of aloneness like I was in that bathroom in Guatemala. The only problem is there is no hope there. But Jesus is there and he is reaching out his hand and he is offering you hope. Would you believe in him? It's a simple process. Would you place your faith in him? Would you recognize that Jesus is the only way to know the Father? And the Father to know you. Would you recognize that Jesus did exactly what he said he did? He came to this earth, he lived the life that you couldn't live, and he died in your place. And if you would embrace him as your Lord and Savior, if you would recognize that at this point in your life that You've been the king of your life, but Jesus is the rightful king, and you would step off of the throne, and you would let Jesus be the king of your life, if you would follow him. As he called his disciples to follow him, would you follow him too? Then Jesus can be your Lord and Savior. Jesus will save you if you call out. The message of Luke is that there is hope in times of medical uncertainty. Yes, we need to call out to Jesus. We need to look to him in times of uncertainty. We need to take the leap of faith and find the reward. And we need to put our faith in Jesus when all hope is lost. And if we do that, no matter what happens, we will have hope. Ultimately, we may be like the woman with the bleeding infirmity. But Jesus will heal even though we have this vicious disease. But we may end up like Jairus' daughter. But we know that that isn't the end of the story. One day that trumpet will sound, that sky will split, and the dead will be raised to life. But only if we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that you would be with us, Lord, that you would uh, call us to repentance. Lord, that you would call us to a hope. Lord, that we would see you as our hope and our foundation. And Lord, that we would run to you in these uncertain times. Lord, no matter what happens, with this coronavirus, Lord, we can turn to you. You are our rock and you are our foundation. Lord, for those of us that know you, I pray that we would uh, step out in faith. 
knowing that you are our protector and knowing that you have this world in your hands. And Lord, for those that don't know you, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name.